Bright Road Channel of Lake Lewis. Before we begin the story, Howley and I like to tell you that arches can be an emotionally intense experience and may not be for everyone. This music by Mo only means one thing. We're back in the echo of 2020 with arches. And we're getting close to the end of the story. And quite frankly, I have no idea how it's going to end up. Only Howley knows. But we're all along for the ride and I hope you're enjoying it. Some of the people who apparently are enjoying the channel uh, because they're my top patrons are Legacy Bucciarati, Burnt Toast, Kartek, Globus Visser, Besuksu, La Cuscaton, Bastian, Brian Hall, Tiger Cub, Ida Corval, Anubis Silverwind, Dissonance, Grizz, Spiderling, Kopi, Sindri Dragowolf, Nightscale, Big Booty Judy, Omar, Sumutu, Andy Peng, Mohamed Al Zamel, Aaron Fox, Exac, Evan King, and Marcus. As usual, all the links for support in the Echo Project on the channel uh, down in the description so we've got all that done out of the way let's take a breath and get back into the story Pain pounds rhythmically in their head like a heavy drumbeat making their ears pin back tightly before they begin to whine then they croak as their sore throat protests against making the sound. They stare at the scene before them, then they blink. But it doesn't help them make better sense of what's in front of them. In fact, it seems to make it worse. Who's making sense of what that's in front of who? These intrusive thoughts about not existing. Who's having these thoughts? See, you're coming round. Fear rises up in his throat. Something deep in his brain tells him to flee that voice, to escape from it. But he's still too confused to figure out who or what he even is right now, because he still feels like nothing. He's also still conscious enough to know that he is, in fact, something. He remembers that he's someone named Cameron. He remembers the situation. He remembers he's been drugged with shrooms and Xanax. His trip has reached its dizzying peak. His sense of self so utterly decimated he isn't sure he's ever going to feel the same again terror and torture the past two days has culminated to this. The moment that his mind gives in and breaks, and Cameron can't tell what's real and what isn't anymore. You realise nothing's real. There's something else too. Despite the terrible loss of who he was, Cameron, this amalgamation he calls Cameron, is sensing things even more vividly than he had just a few minutes ago when he contacted Dev. Cameron sees what's ahead of him, but he's seeing so much more. In his mind's eye, he looks forward, and he sees a myriad of people in front of him, though they're all the same people. Devon, Brian and himself, locked in a vicious spinning blur of claws, teeth, blood, and horrific and identifiable viscera. It's confusing, seeing so many versions of himself and his boyfriend, and he turns his head to glance away, not wanting to see that violence. Then, noticing something over his shoulder, he looks back, and this time he sees one version of himself, along with Brian. He sees his unconscious body being pinned against the tree for a while longer before he crumples to the ground. What the hell? 
His voice is low, husky and barely audible. Ryan laughs, startling the coyote out of his visions of violence. I choked you the fuck out, that's what! Cameron blinks at the bear, then back of the forest. I thought I died. Heh, <laughs> not yet, kid. We got a few things to do first. You probably see your boyfriend too, eh? Not sure I get to talk to him since he knocked out. Knock, knocked out? <laughs> yep. Wait, with what? Relax, just a hypno. Sure, I gave him a good amount, but they had a few decades old because they made him illegal in the States back in the 90s. And you know, when pills get old, they don't work so good anymore. Ryan goes on about Rohypnol, now used to be the premier date rape drug in the country. Cameron watches the bear's mouth move in waves and ripples, yellow teeth poking out from behind his lips as saliva collects and becomes frothy at the corners. Who's watching this? Cameron reassures himself automatically. I'm watching this. I need to save Devon. He's not so convinced by the first part, though. I. Me. Cameron. Simple concepts that aren't so simple anymore. Just like in high school, he stopped existing. It's different this time, though. The Xanax is certainly quashing the panic he should be feeling right now. But this time, his perspective is from a completely different angle. Cameron's amalgamation does still exist, but the borders have dissolved, and he seems to be seeping into everything. Despite already knowing he's insignificant, he's still awestruck by how small Cameron is compared to the world. Even the bugs crawling beneath the leaves make Cameron feel small. An entire world he knows nothing about. But entangling the identity of the universe means he's also entangled with Brian. The bear is missing parts of himself. Kind of like Artie. Shattered pieces and jagged holes pockmarking the landscape of his life. Cameron almost feels sorry for him. That maybe if things had been just a little different... The odds just a little more in Brian's favour. He could have been a very different person. What's really disturbing, though, is the genuine affection he has for Cameron. His urge to caress and hold the coyote, but... There's a hatred there, too. I discussed what Cameron is. Young, attractive, and a fag. Not just queer like Brian considers himself to be, but a faggot. The kind of queer that acts real cute for fucking over the real men who should be doing all the fucking. So it feels good to punish Cameron, but it's even better to watch him suffer, to watch the way his body writhes, his mouth open for air, his eyes wide and fearful. Cameron feels himself recoil for understanding Brian's thought process, a way of thinking he'd never consider himself. But that thought process isn't what makes Brian the terrible person that he is. Cameron knows that most don't have a say in how their sexual interests and fetishes develop, though so the thoughts themselves aren't exactly evil, at least not to Cameron. Cameron knew a few guys from college who had interests similar to Brian. During his first year of dating Devon, the bear had timidly asked him if he could gently close his teeth over the coyote's neck and growl. It was thrilling and intense, and Cameron loved the rush. But then Devon had a nightmare about tearing out Cameron's throat, and that was the end of that. So, to Cameron, Brian isn't all that strange. What makes Brian different isn't that he has fetishes. He's not crazy. He's not a psychopath. No, the true root of Brian's evil is clear. He's selfish, and he's never satisfied with what he gets. Selfish enough to put dozens of young people through hellish torture until they finally died. All while having the capacity to fully control himself. All while having full access to alternatives like roleplay. But it's not enough. He always needs more.
or for his own fleeting drug-fueled sexual gratification because at one point Brian decided that's what makes him feel good so fuck this world that makes him feel bad but he'd found some release in strangling Cameron now his focus is turning back to a vague idea on how to use Cameron's abilities something to stop him from spending the rest of eternity with his victims torturing him Cameron could spoil the ending for Brian let him know that when everyone dies they just cease to be what they were that's it ghosts demons poltergeists creations of the living and whatever it is that's in echo Cameron draws back at this point getting overwhelmed by all the thoughts coming from the old bear unable to understand them without more context looking forward he glimpses the various scenarios again and the one constant is death most involve him dying and a good amount involve Devon dying as well Cameron imagines this is indicative of what's most likely to happen but a few just two in fact show Cameron and Devon surviving with Brian either living or dying Cameron doesn't care much about the latter just as long as he can get Devon himself out of Echo alive I can deal with Brian afterwards. Cameron doesn't even care much if he doesn't make it, especially in this state of mind, but he won't accept not being able to save Devon. Suddenly, remembering what he'd done earlier, Cameron tries to subtly brush his pocket and is amazed that the key is still there. Does Brian know? Well, he does know what Cameron had planned, but in his own excitement, especially because he's tweaked out, he's hyper-focusing on other things. He'd also missed the key being taken out of his pocket. That and Brian's memory is terrible. Decades of drugs and neurotoxic doses had dismantled who he used to be. Doesn't even seem to remember why he choked Cameron in the first place. Had a connection down at Sonora. Stuff was over the fucking counter there, so it was easy to get. Get over the fucking board is a whole different issue. Brian suddenly stops talking, eyes narrowing. Cameron's pulse quickens as he wonders if Brian had just remembered his plan. What's wrong? His voice is still rough from the strangling, a deep soreness starting to emanate from the core of his neck. I know, it's like you're better when you're smiling. But if I'm fucking boring, you just say so. It takes Cameron a few seconds to understand what Brian is even talking about, then a few more to scan the bear's thoughts. In Brian's mind, his smiling has a lot to do with how interesting the bear's over-explanation of Rohypnol is, so Cameron quickly puts one on his face. Oh, sorry, it is really interesting. I'm just overwhelmed with the drugs and... Shut up. Cameron shuts up. Brian starts to work his jaw like he's chewing something before clenching his fists. Cameron tenses up, preparing himself to be hit again. You're cute, but not that cute, and I'm not that stupid. I hate fags like you. Sucking up and sucking dicks, you get what you really want. Ryan's mind flicks through a few faces. The only one defined enough for Cameron to comprehend is a fox in a red hat. And Brian seems to relax. But the anger is still there. The bear having honed it to become more cool and collected, which only makes it all the more terrifying. Sure, stimulants increase empathy in a normal brain. But if Brian abused them to the point that amphetamines feel like caffeine, it probably increases irritability and rage. That's what his mother was like at the end. I always confused Cameron as to why someone would want to do a drug that makes them feel worse. I got a better idea. Cameron gasps as Brian grabs him by the ear. No, no, stop, I can walk with you. I won't try to run. How? Cameron senses the bear's amusement and his fear of being pulled up by the ear again, and then Coyote quickly stifles his begging, realising it might shift Ryan's interest back to using Cameron for torture rather than his abilities. The pain had been blinding, but it's nothing, absolutely nothing compared to what this bear had done to others. Cameron manages to settle into a stumbling walk as Brian pulls him along, bent over and trying to see the ground in the darkness, or while he tries to carefully follow the bear's rough, unpredictable movements. 
Every minute or so, Cameron looks forward and sees the scenario he's aiming for, still within reach, so he keeps walking. Meanwhile, a van emerges from the trees, parked a ways off the side of the road. Ryan freezes, staring. Then he lets out a surprised laugh. Well, I'll be damned. The fucker got away. Who? The coyote winces at Brian continues to hold him by his ear. Cameron hopes he's talking about Devon, even though he can sense the presence of the younger bear just ahead of them. The coyote would be glad to be proven wrong about his abilities, especially if it means Devon gets away. The Cameron knows. That cat! I swear I shot him twice, too! Then again, he didn't do that weird jerking thing people do when you give him the kill shot. So I must have missed the second time. Thought I maybe I just killed him on the first. Cameron looks to where Brian is staring. He sees the spot where Arturo must have been. Dark stains cover the leaves along with what looks like vomit, and Cameron feels his own stomach churn at the sight. It's difficult to connect his outgoing, oblivious friend to the mess, and Cameron feels guilt mingle with his misery as he realises that what's happening to Artie is their fault. But he knows Artie is far away now, miles away, and Cameron silently encourages the cat to keep going, to do whatever he can to save them and himself, even though he's clearly in terrible shape. Cameron hopes Artie can hear him, even if he's awake right now. Cameron senses another ominous shift in the bear's motivation. Brian doesn't think that Artie will make it to the interstate, but he knows he should go looking for the cat. Everything was so fucked from the start. Three young men who liked to have close family and friend groups. All three of them injured, beaten, and all three knowing full well what Brian is capable of. What Brian has done. There's no point to it anymore. Brian also reverted to thinking he'd get away with all of this somehow. But no. This is the end. Well, guess that's it then. Maybe it's getting close for a while now. The calm with which Brian accepts his nearing demise makes Karen want to try to escape all over again. Why can't this bear just end it without taking them down with him? It's the end for him, not them. Can I see Devon? Cameron half-heartedly smiles, hoping it might sway the bear, but he's not paying attention to the coyote. Brian shakes his head at the sober version of himself, the version that actually did plan to let Cameron go. Because why would he add to his problems by killing the yoke if said yoke could take them all away? That's why he tried to be nice to him. And then, of course, things got out of hand. Cameron begins to shake as he senses Brian's arousal and excitement. He's thinking about Cameron, about his baggie full of bath salts, and about how long it might take to find them in. Cameron blanches mentally, unsure what that dark place full of death is, but he knows he does not want to go there. Where are you taking me? You are a psychic. Figure it out. Keeping his hold on the coyote, Ryan pulls Cameron toward the van. It isn't long before Artie realises the lights on the interstate are actually a lot farther away than he had thought. He has no idea how long he's been walking. It feels like at least an hour. The road is maybe just a little closer. At this point, he's so weak, his movement's so uncoordinated, that deep down he knows his body's about to give up. Every dizzy spell, every wave of anxiety, it terrifies the cat that he might have another seizure, and if he does, he knows he won't be getting back up. Artie, please. You can? Artie looks around hopefully. He'd probably start crying right now if Cameron just showed up. Wouldn't be because he wouldn't be alone anymore. But then Artie sees a pair of headlights closer than the others. And it gets closer and closer. Artie notes the lights are coming right toward him. He doesn't bother getting off the road. Feeling like this must be a light at the end of the tunnel situation. Then the lights slow and Artie hears the sound of an engine. What the fuck are you doing standing there like a fucking idiot in the fucking road? Artie's ears twitch, recognising the voice from someone in his past, 
what might as well be another life. It's hard to tell because they're screaming at him. The car door opens and Artie just stands there, lost in the light. I told you guys to fuck off. First the fucking bar is closed because some fucking call. Now you start you to fuck with me. I just want to fucking... Can you drink to... Can you relax? Arturo furrows his brows. Never had heard the curse word used in such a way. The figure starts to materialize in front of Arturo and finally recognizes him. What happened to you? The weasel stares at him, then tilts his head to the side, squinting before reaching out and turning Arturo slightly by the shoulder. Shit, there's no way. He couldn't be that fucking... The weasel trails off and looks at Artie's face. Who did this? Artie reluctantly opens his mouth, for some reason feeling almost embarrassed by his condition. <laughs> the weasel stares at him with an odd look. Ah, yeah, it's at the bar. It's closed. But, but, there. There, Brian? Arturo nods and regrets it immediately as he almost falls over. Damn, you're real fucked up, aren't you? Arturo stares back at the weasel and notes his expression, like he's trying to decide something. It's not the right reaction to the situation, and Artie suddenly feels like he might be in danger. He has no idea why. All he remembers this old man had floored Devon with two swings, so combined with his current state, he can't do a thing. Then the weasel seems to come out of whatever it is he was thinking about. Well, I'll be damned. This is it then, isn't it? A stupid motherfucker. Alright, get in. We're going to the hospital. Arturo stumbles forward. Once the weasel realises he's having trouble moving at all, he helps Arturo inside. As he does, the weasel sucks in a breath, grimacing. Jesus Christ, it's really making me want to do what I'm going to have to do after this. But you know, everything's got to end eventually. Arturo is in short what the old weasel is talking about. If he's taken him to the hospital, then he's at least on the right track. Friends. Yeah, yeah. I'll call Payton PD once I drop you off. Gotta make sure I can beat him back, though. Arturo decides it's the weasel who's acting strange. As the strange weasel starts to make a three point turn to drive back towards the interstate, Arturo is only grateful. He's done what he can, and now the rest is up to God. He can only pray. So he prays for Devon, Cameron, Maria and himself. Because if he survives, he knows the road in front of him is long, fractured and broken. Devon feels his body bounced and shaken on a hard metallic surface, occasionally leaning from side to side, feeling like he's laying down in a car taking sharp turns. The bear opens his eyes, groaning. Dev? Uh, Cam? Is Cameron driving? A coyote has his own sedan that he drives, but usually if they're out together it's in Devon's jeep. First he thinks maybe he's given the wheel to the coyote so he himself can get some rest. But they came in the jeep and Cameron can't drive standard, right? Come on, stop assuming things. Lately Cameron seems to bristle whenever he does. Lately as in ever since they got to Echo. Devon, I'm here. How are you doing? Cameron's concerned, gentle voice is clearly masking something strained and desperate underneath. Cameron, what, what's it? What's wrong? I told you, he's all drugged up. He can barely talk. Cam? Exactly, I told you I roofied him. It's like blacking out. Anyway, it's wearing off. He's just tired. Is that blood? Why is he bleeding? Did it himself. Imagine what a mess we'd have if he wasn't drunk, right? Now trust a bear to stay put when you chain him up. Evan, can you hear me? Are you okay? Yeah, yes. Then 
Then he's drifting back to sleep again. More sounds are driving on the rough road, gravel grinding in the wheels and hitting the undercarriage. When he comes to again, it's stopped, and Devon realises the van doors are open. Looks how it did, they wear off just in time. Can I go to him, please? Devon sees that one of Cameron's ears is twisted in the older bear's grasp. The coyote's head tilted to the side, winces as he tries to get a better look at Devon. The younger bear becomes very still, seeing his best friend being held by the worst person he's ever met. One of his soft, sensitive ears that Devon had played with it countless times in the past is now twisted tightly onto itself. And Ryan's at the paw he holds a shotgun. On top of it all, Ryan looks angrier than usual. In fact, he's looking at Cameron with an expression of utter contempt, all while Cameron isn't paying attention to him, looking intently at Devon instead. A course, fucking typical. I'm glad I saved this. He suddenly grabs the coyote by the shoulders and turns Cameron around to face him, to face away from Devon. Even so, there's no confusion of what happens to Cameron next. Ryan turns slightly away from Cameron, then spins and sends the back of his fist across the coyote's muzzle. The sound is so loud Devon is shocked awake, adrenaline compensating for the sedative. At first, Devon refuses to believe what he just saw. The sound like that could have been made with Cameron's muzzle. The coyote's head snaps to the right where he instantly starts to crumple, but Brian holds him up. Hey! Devon yells automatically, shocked by what he just saw. He'd never seen someone hit that hard in his entire life. The silence that follows, the distinct sound of something small clatters around the van, as if a plastic bead had been thrown against the metal walls. Devon hears it land next to him, and looking down he sees something long spinning in place before finally coming to a stop. It's thin, white, and it starts wide but tapers to a sharp point. Devon only has a moment to focus on if he grunts as Cameron lands on top of him, Brian having pushed him over. As he's looking down at the coyote and sees the blood begin to seep from his mouth, Devon realises the white thing is one of Cameron's teeth, and shocked anger overcomes the fear. Hey! All sense has seemingly left Devon, everything is feeling and thinking condensing down to that one word he screams to express his rage. Come, come! Panic is making him breathe fast, though he tries to keep his chest from heaving to avoid bouncing Cameron's head. Brian hit him so hard it definitely could have killed him. What makes it all the more terrifying is the way Cameron's body went limp. Being so reminiscent of Artie's sudden collapse when he'd suddenly lost his life. The Cameron is breathing, though it's in a terrible, snorting way. Come me, baby. Can you hear me? The panic in his voice lows to almost pitiful whine as he stares at the coyote twitching, his eyes half open and his head turning back and forth slowly. Whoops, think about me what I meant to. Heh, <laughs> fuck that hurt. Ryan shakes the poor used to hit Cameron, as if bashing Cameron's muzzle made it sting. Devon's raid crescendos once more. Ryan, I will fucking kill you! Ryan looks surprised for just a second. He goes on grinning, enjoying the reactions if he's watching the show. This only makes Devon angrier. I'll knock every tooth out of your fucking head! I'll tear your throat out! Oh, oh. Devon's voice weakens, breaks and then trails off under Brian's apparent glee at the younger bear's fury. Realising that Cameron's ears are twitching and shouting, Devon returns his attention to Cameron as the coyote lets out a low, rasping groan. Cameron, honey, you can hear me, right? Cameron? Meanwhile, blood oozes out of the coyote's nose and mouth, seeping into the fur on Devon's stomach and side. Devon tries to keep his sobbing and gasping to a minimum as Cameron's head continues to rest over his diaphragm. Cameron's eyes flutter, then he blinks, and Devon sees the light of consciousness re-enter his eyes. Come! Devon? Cameron grunts under his breath, lifting his head slightly. Brian already looks bored of the catastrophe he just created. Now he keeps looking over his shoulder into the darkness that stretches behind him, shifting impatiently. Alright, make it quick, yo. We need to get moving. 
Don't you touch him. You could have broken his fucking neck. Evan's voice cracks and turns hoarse again. Ryan bristles, finally reacting. Devon turns his attention back to Cameron, and you to try and gently coax him to a state of consciousness. Come on, baby. Can you hear me? Can you understand what I'm saying? Slowly, Cameron lifts his head, a mixture of blood and saliva connecting his lip to Devon's fur in a long strand. I'm okay. I'm fine. Cameron sounds confused as he mumbles, trying to get up unsteadily. No, stay still. No, get up. Don't tell you what you do, you do to your bear if you don't. Then do it. Come over here and do it, you fucking coward. You fucking scum. Devon. Cameron's voice is calm, albeit quiet, a weak, and the bear goes silent as he focuses back on the coyote. He has his head lifted, trying to focus on Devon's face. Who's feeling this right now? The question catches the bear by surprise. What? The mines, that's right. I'm going to the mines and I'm coming back for you. Cameron clasps the paw to his muzzle, wincing hard as he shuts his eyes tight. What? What mines? Stay here. Evan's eyes well up with tears, seeing the coyotes barely coherent, barely able to understand what's happening. Cameron leads him to kiss the bear, again taking Devon by surprise. He immediately smells and tastes Cameron's blood, making the gorge rise in his throat. It reminds him of his predatory nightmares, but Cameron insists so Devon forces himself not to heave. He does want to feel the gap where Cameron's lower left canine used to be, in even as his already swelling muzzle. As he forces himself to kiss back, he feels something else press against his lips. Something hard and oddly shaped, and Devon opens his muzzle, allowing the blood to flood into his mouth. But with it comes something else, and Devon realises all at once that it's the key. Devon manoeuvres the key into his muzzle as subtly as he can, hearing Brian sigh impatiently behind Cameron. Slides under his tongue, tying in his comparatively large muzzle. Cameron whispers into Devon's ear, We're going to go back home together, I promise. Where are you going? For the mines. Honey, please. Devon can't keep the whining panic out of his voice. Sound like a cub, imagine to keep the words clear with a tiny key under his tongue. Devon just stares at Cameron as he pulls back, tears rolling down his cheeks as the coyote crawls weakly to his feet and steadies himself against the wall of the van. Eh, yeah, you're fine. He turns his gaze back to the furious sobbing bear. Sit tight, kid. We'll be back in a little while. I promise. Being knocked out, regaining consciousness, stumbling his way through the dark, all an untold amount of shrooms is... harrowing. That's the only word Cameron feels is appropriate for this situation. Harrowing. The world is more dreamlike than his dreams. This combination of disorientating factors leaves Cameron fumbling through a series of events immediately after he'd reached the old bear. Ryan grabbed his paw and said they were moving swiftly through the desert before Cameron is pulled into a place that's cold and dark, lit up dimly by an old electric lantern, his handle hanging from the barrel of Brian's shotgun. Cameron thought his perception of time was fucked on weed, now it's twisted over on itself. He's exhausted, having not eaten a proper meal in well over a day his throat is so dry he thinks he might be willing to drink Brian's drugged water. Each time Brian goes around a bend first, or his bulk obscures it, the lantern's light disappears and leaves Cameron in darkness. Each time that happens, brilliant red arcs crowd his vision. Who's in the darkness? I am. I am in the darkness. Everything is in darkness. No, just me. Stop fighting it, only make it worse. Cameron is surprised by the bear's sudden appearance. 
Where am I? Ryan sighs heavily again. Doesn't matter. But... Cameron crumbles up as something jabs him hard in the sternum, twisting it on himself, feeling the black hole open in his chest. Sucks the rest of his body and attention into it, the canine curls up on the hard dirt floor, whining and grunting. Finally, Airy turns to his lungs. As it does, he hears a snorting sound again. After a while, Cameron looks up from his position on the ground to see Brian on his knees, appearing to smell the stock of his shotgun. And Cameron notices the white powder. He understands what's happening. Cameron hears a familiar voice, when he's sure he's hearing, not imagining. Don't snort it. You're trying to coat your nasal cavity, not your fucking lungs. That's how my friends did it. Then your friends are fucking idiots. Brian looks up from his disappearing line of bath salts. Who are you talking to? Cameron quietly tries to hush Dylan, but Brian already heard them. On top of that, Brian doesn't seem angry or upset. His continued stare demands an answer. Um, his name's Dylan. He's my ex. Sorry, we don't get along well. You getting some third man syndrome? Never get real fucked up on too many drugs for too long. Person always shows up. And I'm having a conversation with him and everything. Ryan readjusts the way he's holding his lantern and gun and grabs Cameron's arm with the other. It happens to people in survival situations too. Anyway, I'm always too delirious to remember who the third man is. Yeah. Cameron can't understand how Dylan isn't real, but this nightmare bear apparently is. Has he been tricked? Alright, here's the deal. I'll stop hitting you as long as you're smiling, got it? Huh? Brian clenches his fists meaningfully. Cameron winces, then quickly stretches his mouth into a large smile. Even though it hurts to the point the tears well up in his eyes. Oh, sorry. I never thought you were talking about for a second. I remember now. Sure you do, pathetic faggot. Ryan continues to inspect Cameron as the go to remains quiet, keeping a smile plastered on his face. This experience is too much. All of this is too much. He just wants it to stop. He'll do whatever this bear, this source for his torment, wants if it prevents him from being hurt again. Guess I did bust your chops pretty good, huh? Hmm. Cameron flinches as the bear grabbed his badly aching muzzle in one giant paw. Wait, please don't. Ah! Cameron cringes hard but tries his best to hold still. Yeah, but I'll get tough too. Swear up a bit, be cute with your face all messed up like that. Dubai's gonna look real ugly by tomorrow morning. But it'll matter. Which is hard to look at you now with that stupid scar. Ryan lets go and grabs his shoulder instead, at the same time glancing at Cameron's shirt. You're from Bridgetown? Timber City? Or you just picked up the Goodwill? I always say, when you shop in the Goodwill, never pick up clothes that have anything to do with the place. Fuck, it's a few years back, I look at a Western sweatshirt from the Salvation Army and. Cameron follows along silently. Meanwhile, that third presence has shifted into something else. Something a bit more familiar. Ryan's getting chatty again from the second dose he took. Anyway, yeah, that city's overrun with Antifa and all that. A true liberal housecape if ever was one. His mother, falling behind them, is holding his paw. Looking back, he can't see her clearly, but he knows it's her. It's, it's okay. A lot of the time it's outside groups coming to the city making trouble. It even sounds like her. Defending the city they both grew up in despite its problems. Despite its streets becoming a stage of the country's culture wars to physically play out. Even while they suffered on the outskirts of what was supposed to be a liberal bastion lit up by the lights of tolerance and welfare. But instead glowing orange from burning cars and flashbangs. And yet, they defended it, because they both believed in its core principles. Now, though, Cameron looks behind himself while also looking back. He's taller than she is, and he's reminded of just how small she was. How small she'd seemed to him now she'd survived. 
He would have saved her too, if she could have held on just a little longer. But how much longer? Four, five years? Could she have held on that long? No, not with her habit and the amount she was using. And though Cameron doesn't want to admit it, it was her death that spurred him to make the first serious change in his life. His mom wasn't a good mom. All things considered, she shouldn't have ever had children. But how can he judge? She was just 17 years old, excited and in love, living over a 70s Chevy van. All that came to an end when he was born in December 1995. Then in his abusive, probably schizophrenic father left, committed suicide sometime in the mid-2000s. For a few months in 1995, his parents truly wanted to make a good life for him. That feeling from that moment in time overwhelms Cameron. They wanted him to be happy, successful, and they truly thought he'd be the one to break the curse of poverty on both their families. And even though they wanted that for him, they especially wanted him to be happy, to have a family life and childhood that both his parents were only able to see how the kids enjoy from afar. They tried. But it's the most typical love story for people like them. Because then, like in all those other stories, things break, and then things settle. He did the exact same before Devon. She should have taken more precautions. She left him alone in the trailer often, her medications and recreational drugs freely available to experiment with while she was at work. He became an addict just like her. He'd come to understand the baggage that comes with that label. It's not just about a craving or a desire for something. Everyone has that. No, it's about who you are as a person. A liar, a thief, a cheater. Someone willing to do anything to get whatever it is their addiction demands. Anything to feel good. Whether it's pathetically checking all the coin dispensers in the casino once you spend your life savings, or pathetically combing through the carpet whatever drug it is you're starting to come down from. The only thing that saved him from that life and death was his grades. Somehow, through all the substance abuse and neglect, he was a straight-A student. That's what got him a partial scholarship to the University of Pueblo. And that's what got him out to the trailer park surrounding Bridgetown into this state's flagship university. A few schools in his own state had better offers, but Pueblo was the most prestigious of all the schools he got accepted into. A top 100 school with the best ranked nursing and engineering programs in the region. That, and at the time, Cameron wanted to be far away from Bridgetown, even if that meant the desert. And then he met Devon. She wasn't a good mom. But she was a great person, a wonderful person, and she did the best she could with what she had at the time. She brought him into a chaotic, unstable life, a life that she saved multiple times, while he occasionally wished his mother would have just let him die. But now, Cameron is only thankful. While most of his life was tough, the past five years had been better than he would have ever dared dream was possible. His life was perfect up until yesterday, when they got here. Tears run down his face, conflicted about how he should feel, but just knowing that he misses her, that he loves her, that he hopes she's okay, wherever she is. This third person squeezes his paw reassuringly. Cameron squeezes back, and he's comforted by the feeling of this moment he's sealed off from Brian and the town. It's just him and his mom walking through these mines. She tells him she's proud of him graduating high school and college, and she's happy he found Devon. Would she really be proud of him if she knew what he studied? If she was still around? Oh, a major in business administration or, or something. What did you major in? Smile. A gentle voice from behind him, barely audible and carried on the soft breeze that grows weaker the deeper they go into these tunnels. Uh, music theory. Why are you supposed to do with that? A 
teach? The automatic answer, when really you prepared for all his sceptical friends who go into STEM-related fields. You're a teacher? Oh, no, but that was my plan. Well, some plan. I mean, I didn't go into any debt, so I had financial freedom after I graduated. You know, you're pretty cool, even if someone who's on that many shrooms. Most people lose their minds. Oh, I am. I definitely am. It's... I don't know. I have more control than I did the first time I tried it. In fact, Cameron feels like he's losing his mind right now, laughing even though it makes every part of his body ache. Xanax is like magic when you're panicking. Anyway, what's it you do for a living? It'll all pay off. Judging by the tone in Brian's voice, he already knows the answer to that. Um, a customer support for Julian. What's that? Working with Kenry Omenu twice. Back in the 80s, they used to beat people up for working with companies like that. Cameron's at a loss for words, We're only for a moment. Oh, okay. Julian, the current market leader in smartphone manufacturing, is Taiwanese, and the coyote assumes that the bear is thinking of a certain other country in the same region. Either way, it's a strange and disturbing aside. That's just Brian. And sometimes with Brian, it's best for Cameron to just keep his mouth shut and to also keep on smiling. So, I'm music. You sing? Cameron wishes the bear would stop asking him questions, making small talk like any of this is a routine part of their lives. But the coyote seems bath salts will make anyone talkative. Uh, kind of. Why do you mean kind of? Either you sing or you don't. Well, yeah, I mean, I sing, but I'm not very good. I mean, you fucking better be, you spent four years learning. How about you sing and I'll decide? It's getting harder to keep up the cheerful charade as Cameron senses the cruel, malicious arousal rising up inside of Ryan again. The second dose is making him do more than just talk too much. Uh, sure, it's got a thing I want to sing. Anything you want to hear? I don't know if 90s grunge and alternative rock. Yeah, yeah, walking, talking stereotype, aren't you? You write your own music? I definitely tried. A subtle twitch for noise ripples through the air. Yeah, one thing that really pisses me off when someone's acting like an overly humble little bitch. Either you do or you don't. Either you're good at it or you're not. Either you offer something different or you fucking don't. So which the fuck is it? I do, I can. Just give me a second. The corners of Cameron's muzzle turn down slightly, his composure almost crumbling. He's doing the best he can under the current circumstances. He needs help. Heaven, where are you? Ryan's attitude shifts from one extreme to the next, making Cameron feel a sort of emotional whiplash. As long as it keeps him from getting hit, or more importantly killed, then he's fine with that. Tentatively, Cameron starts to sing, choosing the song that got him the most attention. The one that was played in moderate rotation at Mountain West Colleges, along with a few in the Northwest. A song about his ex, Dylan, about their mutual love and hate for each other about the abuse they used to hurl at each other, physical and mental, and finally, about their breakup. His voice is rough and cracked, or some of it's because he isn't warmed up, it's mostly due to having his throat crushed. Dehydration and screaming doesn't help either. Aside from jolting each time Brian pulls him in a different direction, Cameron finds a melody and rhythm. As he does, he becomes a bit more bold, singing louder until his voice carries through the tunnels. Feels very strange with his swelling muzzle and missing tooth. Ryan still says nothing, and Cameron realizes he's listening intently. Well, this makes the coyote nervous. He knows it's better than the bear being angry, and mainly just needs to keep singing. Devon is in the mines with them. He needs directions. Cameron just wishes he didn't feel like he's leading Devon to his own demise. Finding the entrance wasn't hard. While the main entrance had been blocked off with rebar before being filled and sealed with concrete, he knew about the side entrance from the supernatural forums he researched before coming here. That and Cameron's blood was sprinkled here and there, and the scent of it spurred Devon on. Of course, it led right to that entrance. 
It started unlocking his cuffs the second he thought Brian might be out of earshot. It fumbled with a tiny, slippery key while freeing his wrists, revealing blood-crusted fur matted down to the broken skin. Now Devon moves through the mines in complete darkness. It's almost suffocating, almost panic-inducing. The scent of Cameron mixing with the foul odour of Brian pushes the younger bear deeper into the tunnels. The air feels tense, as if the mine itself is intent on seeing what happens next. He's not going to fall into another abyss. When Lupita died, it had been an accident, one that happened after a tornado shredded their town, levering the block across the street, but leaving their house mostly intact. As a twelve-year-old, he just didn't think that it could happen. They had survived the actual disaster. Just as the relief started to set in, his guard started to come down. It happened. He felt powerless in that situation. He knew that her death had happened because of him. But this time is different. He couldn't fight what took Lupita, but he can fight what's taking Cameron. Damn it. After about ten minutes, though, Devon starts to become more agitated, able to hear them any longer, and go by scent alone, Devon can tell he's lost a trail. Shit, 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 shit. He hisses through his teeth, trying to keep quiet in case Brian is somehow nearby, lying in wait. And then, somehow, he hears Cameron's singing voice. Devon goes completely still. He'd recognise his boyfriend's voice anywhere, of course, but Cameron's style is different. Having the qualities of a singer from the 50s or retaining a grunge like roughness. The coyote was heavily influenced by the black and white musicals his mother used to watch late at night. He was embarrassed about it after being critiqued in one of his vocal performance classes, and he'd been trying to change his technique when Devon first met him. But Devon always liked Cameron's voice. It was due to Devon's urgent that Cameron leaned into his style. Devon begins moving as fast as he can while staying quiet. He knocks his nose into a few walls and scrapes up his elbows and shoulders, but he keeps moving, simply trying to force his way in the direction of the voice. Then just as he thinks he's a few turns away, it stops. Then Cameron screams and Devon drops all attempts at stealth. Come, Brian! He calls out to let Brian know he's there, to at least distract him from the coyote. Then he barrels his way through the darkness, trying to find what he's sure is the last turn. Why Brian has brought Cameron here, he doesn't know. He doesn't even know what he's going to do when he meets them. Well, anything. He'll do anything. Brian is looking a bit more distracted, starting to scan the tunnel wall before his eyes settle on what looks like a large crack from the ceiling to the ground. Cameron turns up his singing a notch, knowing this is their destination at the end of the road. The old bear glances at him, looking annoyed. This, for whatever reason, is what brings Brian out of his stimulant-induced hyperfocus. Brian finally realises what's happening. It's only now the old bear remembers Cameron's plan to take the key. Even Cameron forgot. But now a huge paw flies through his pocket, digging inside and realises it's too late for he whirls on Cameron. Oh, you little faggot! Cameron turns and runs, trying to take advantage of Brian and let him go for those couple of seconds. Something pounds into Cameron's lower back, just to the right, and it feels like a cannonball being smashed through his body. Cameron's launched forward against a tunnel wall directly in front of him and tries to hold on to it, sliding down slightly as he stares straight up into the darkness. It's so dark that Cameron can't tell the scene is a few feet above him, or it's simply endless space full of glowing arches that stretch on forever. His eyes stay wide, his breath leaking out of his muzzle in a slow, high-pitched rasp, not wanting to believe the pain he feels spreading through his insides is real. He's on the ground, writhing and groaning uncontrollably while electric pain spiderwebs through his body. The blows Brian delivered before are nothing compared to this. Cameron thrashes around in the dirt, desperate to find a way out of the hell. He's in hell. Who's in hell? He has to be. What are those red arches? Why are flames spreading from his guts up into his lungs? Damn, he probably only pissed blood out of that one. Ryan's mock concerned voice snaps Cameron back to the situation he's in, and in the very back of his head he realises his trip is beginning its descent. 
pain is still present though and it's not letting up. How can he feel pain if he's nothing? He's finally breathing again. Reach exhale is accompanied by a whining wheeze, involuntary tears rolling down his face. Brian leans over him and the coyote cringes. No, stop, please. Brian pauses, just grabs Cameron by the arm and yanks him up. Cameron lets out a hoarse, breathless scream as his aching body is forced to move again. The echoes around the floor, cutting off the huge arm tightens around Cameron's throat. Cam! Ryan! Devon's voice is very close, maybe only a tunnel or two away. Ryan mumbles quietly next to Cameron's ear. Shut the fuck up right now or obliterate your other kidney, got it? Cameron feels the threat hovering over the left side of his back this time and quickly shuts his muzzle, even though groans still force their way up, muffled behind his lips. This seems to at least satisfy Brian. He drops the chalk ho- chokehold before shoving Cameron forward. First, Cameron surprised the bed and just hit him again anyway, but Brian is distracted again. Devon's too close. A few terrible plans go through the older bear's head that causes Cameron's already aching abdomen to lurch with nausea and fear. Brian considers waiting and ambushing Dev. He quickly discards the idea as he realises Cameron might try to warn Devon by making noise right as he reaches them. Exactly what Cameron would do, even means being beaten to death by Brian. Deciding again that nothing matters anymore, he pushes Cameron forward through the narrow opening, the passage becoming more tight until Brian has to turn sideways and struggle through, and then it opens up. Cameron smells death. He instinctively backs up, right into Brian. No, 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 please don't do this. I can't, I can't. He can't finish the sentence. Ryan's victim's felt pain and still seems unimaginable to the coyote. Knowing Devon is close behind them, Cameron makes one last effort to turn and dodge around Brian. The bear is far too large, he easily grabs at the coyote and throws him further into the hollow. Cameron comes up immediately, trying to suppress his whines and whimpers. Ryan, just wait a second. Think about it. I can help you. Why'd you bring me here in the first place? Ryan gives Cameron a dispassionate look, but he does pause and that gives Cameron some hope. And some time. Let me talk to them. Let me see if I can reason with them. We both know this, all of this, is over. Cameron senses a slight shift in Brian's intentions as the bear begins to seriously consider Cameron's reasoning. I know you need my help. I can feel them. They want you, Brian, and they're waiting for you. I know what it can be like, walking in circles for most of your life, making the same stupid mistakes and knowing what you need to do to get better, and just never doing it. Oh, yeah? I finally did, and my life was almost perfect. Until I met you. Let's do it. Let's end this nightmare right now. Ryan takes a deep breath and holds it. The entire mine, the entire town seems to hold its breath with him, and Cameron starts to understand how deeply entwined this bear is with this place. This entity that seems to be pulling all the strings. Cameron can feel the monolithic entity shift and turn, as if it too senses an inevitable end. Brian is close to taking the coyote's offer, but it isn't meant to be, and Cameron, of course, knows that. A scuffling from the entrance announces Devon's arrival. Guess he's finally here, huh? Glad I bought my ten cage. I was hoping sure he got good firepower when bears are involved, eh? Cameron watches in horror as the old bear opens up the shotgun for inserting the shell. Cameron's mind is blank as he automatically lunges at the huge bear, grabbing the shotgun barrel as Brian snarls in rage. Everything's falling apart. You're spiralling. Devon shoves his bulk through the narrow passage, squeezing two of the hollow on the other side. When he stumbles in the open space, Devon spots Cameron immediately, the outer being swung left and right as he fights with Brian over the shotgun. Cameron is covered in blood, tears matting the fur on his cheeks. The situation is already a terrible one, but again his fear for Cameron turns to anger at Brian as he sees the bear throwing vicious, crushing kicks at Cameron's lower body. 
Devon realises this is it and he has no time to think. Devon charges up behind the older bear and bites deeply into the side of Brian's neck. Apparently, biting someone other than himself is a lot more effective. He feels his canine sink deep into the flesh beneath the thick fur. The old man is covered in a layer of protective padding, just like himself. The older bear clearly has a lot more of it. Still, Brian screams, high-pitched and full of fury. Then, Cameron is finally shaken loose from the shotgun, and Brian grabs the barrel with both paws for ramming the butt of the shotgun back into Devon's stomach. The younger bear wretches and crumples over, who manages to grab the shotgun, holding onto the stock tightly. Brian, clearly aware of how bad the situation could become for him, lets go of the shotgun so he can turn around and throw a knee up into Devon's hunched form, an inch above the navel, almost the exact spot he did earlier. Devon feels if his guts are flattened to his spine before liquefying, the force actually lifting him off the ground for a half second. Even though he lands on his feet, he immediately sinks to his knees, muzzle wide open as he continues a battle with his own lungs, all while still trying to hold on to the shotgun. You're a dead man walking, boy. Well, on your knees anyway. What a surprise. Ryan fumbles shakily to find the stock of the shotgun, hidden somewhere under Devon's bulk, while simultaneously trying to avoid the end of the barrel, in case Devon is able to find the trigger. The attack had been enough to rattle Brian, even if it was short-lived. Devon curses himself, trying to move, knowing he probably can't win, but he needs to do something, maybe hurt Brian so bad that Cameron can at least get away. Get up! But he can't breathe, there's not much he can do to defend himself, let alone stand up. So Devon keeps his hold on the shotgun even as Brian starts trying to yank it from his weakened grasp and he's starting to succeed. Cam, run! Devon rasps, not even sure where Cameron is right now, assuming he still might be on the ground having kicked so many times. Brian squeals. Looking up from his doubled up position, Devon sees Brian in front of him, bent over as well, the grizzled bear grabbing between his legs. As Brian sinks lower, Cameron appears, lowering a foot. Lakoti smiles with relief and joy at seeing Devon and seeing he's got the shotgun. Cameron seems so sure they've won he doesn't see Brian's quick recovery, the old bear forcing himself up, murderous vengeance in his eyes as he runs at Cameron with another animalistic scream. Devon can only watch as the huge bear charges at Cameron. No! The much smaller coyote can only yelp in panic before Brian smashes into him and crushes him against the wall. Devon hears a crunching sound as he gets his first tiny sip of air, just as he hears Cameron's own air wheeze out in a yowl-like moan. And even more viciously than Devon has attacked Brian, the old bear begins to maul Cameron. Brian bashes him left and right with blows into the coyote's face while Cameron collapses. There, Brian begins to rip and tear into the coyote with his claws. Devon begins to move, but slow. He just wishes his lungs would start working. He struggles with a shotgun, but it suddenly opens up and Devon doesn't know anything about working guns. So he leaves it behind, just knowing that he needs to stop Brian. Cameron tries to call away from Brian, and Devon sees the horror mirrored in his boyfriend's eyes. Then Brian comes down on him again, and Cameron throws his left elbow back at the bear's face, only for Brian to sink his teeth into Cameron's forearm and elbow. Then he twists and tears, and Cameron lets out a howling sound, his body twisting violently. He's on his back now, and he goes quiet, staring in shock at the wall he's laying perpendicular to. His eyes begin to roll up as Brian thrashes his head, and a crunch comes from Cameron's arm. The coyote can't make any sounds now, the breath seemingly knocked out of him by the pain. Devon's never heard Cameron make those feral pain sounds, not like this. It seems so much agony that he can't breathe, can't even vocalise it anymore. He gives Devon the final push he needs. He charges into Brian, the force knocks the old bear off the coyote. Devon never seriously mauled someone his entire life. But it's something that comes naturally to him and Brian. Why do you play more people in the past, including Cameron? This is the first time he brings his claws, teeth and muscles to full use. Straddling the older bear, Devon roars at Brian for luncheon down. First he bites Brian's neck again, from the front this time while his paws rip and tear into the bigger bear's hind. Brian seems to concentrate for a second while burying his fist up into Devon's stomach. The younger bear is tensed up this time and the fist gets no further in his stomach muscles. 
still. Brian's power is almost supernatural, and Devon lurches and grunts, falling over, an ache forming deep in the pit of his belly. Only makes him bite harder. Devon can feel he's truly stunned the old bear, at least for now, as Brian takes his fist back and resorts to panic shoves instead of actually trying to fight. When Brian finally does try to claw at Devon's face and eyes, the younger bear leans back and smashes his head into Brian's muzzle. The sound he makes indicates a broken snout, and Brian lets out another high-pitched whine before screaming and trying to lunge up to bite Devon's neck. Devon leans back, just avoiding the teeth before smashing his head a second time into Brian's face. Then, as Brian lays dazed, Devon lays into his snout three times, full force, trying to pound every bit of agony into Brian that the old bear had given all of them. That would be impossible, though. Still, Devon feels a savage satisfaction as he sees at least two of the old bear's yellow teeth roll out of his muzzle. Brian howls and rolls violently, finally dislodging the slightly smaller bear. Devon heaves for breath, watches Brian comes up several feet away, crouching, also heaving for breath. You fucking... you! Brian can barely form words, not just because he's out of breath. His bitter hatred is evident, so mad that only frothy spit flies from his lips as he sputters. Then Brian's eyes flick to the right, never remembers all at once he'd left the gun there, I mean focused on helping Cameron. The old bear moves lightning fast once again, and he shoots off to the right and Devon realises Cameron is there too. Cameron, look out! Cameron, laying in agony after Brian's vicious attack, knows something is deeply wrong with his body. The crushing against the wall of the chamber had done it. The true pain, though, emanates from his left arm, and Cameron knows it's mangled, broken and useless. But he can still use his legs, and Cameron forces himself to get up and start moving with the shotgun, hearing the snarls and growls of the bears behind him. He does his best to stay quiet, but stifled grunts and small squeaks force their way out of his throat. As soon as he touches the shotgun, though, he hears Devon shout, Cameron, look! And again, the nightmare that Brian is tearing his body, pinning him to the wall, and Cameron screams in terror as the huge bear starts trying to bite his neck. The panic coyote is only just able to get his unbroken arm up. It's maybe only three seconds before Devon is there, but it feels like an eternity. Cameron considering how badly it might feel to die from having his throat ripped out. Cameron's right arm is torn up as well, since Brian is just gnawing and isn't shaking his head this time. His bones, at least, remain intact. And Devon wrenches the bigger bear off of him. Cameron tries to get up, to crawl, but it's useless. His body too beaten and broken to anything other than dragging himself away. He hears Brian's high-pitched squeeding again, and this time it's genuinely terrified. Cameron looks over and sees the old bear is now on his back with his arm in a sort of hole by Devon. Devon is laying on his back, Brian's arm pulled towards his chest. Devon's hips close to the older bear's shoulders, his legs locked together at the ankles. Devon grunts and heaves with all his might, his huge, powerful body arching towards the ceiling. Devon is intent on really hurting Brian this time, wanting to make sure he pays the old man back for Cameron's tooth and arm. So with the tooth part avenged, Devon focuses on destroying the other bear's arm. Bear bones are especially hard to break. Devon's never had a broken bone in his life. But the younger bear knows a thing or two about applying force. His dad watched MMA all the time. While he knows little about fighting, he knows why arm bars can be so devastating. He he leans back, bending the big bear's arm over his inner thigh. Only a few cracks are heard, but something serious. Devon needs the arm to have less resistance, more distance from the fulcrum. Unlocking his legs, he takes just a second to slam his foot right into the old bear's jaw. Just a second, Brian goes limp, and Devon relocks his ankles before lifting the limp arm away from his chest and curling up. Then he heaves back on the arm again, arching hard while he twists his body. Talk! Now you're thinking like an engineer. As the catchphrase of one of Devon's old professors comes to his mind, a crack splits the air, and Brian screams somehow reach a new panicked pitch. Devon looks over to see Cameron has dragged himself a few feet away, leaving a dark, horrible blood trail smeared behind him. Devon stumbles over to him, hovering his paws over the coyote's neck. Baby, your neck. Let me see it. He... he didn't get me. Let's go. 
Cameron is in no shape to run, so he groans as Devon lifts him to his arms, the bear starting to stumble toward the exit. Devon looks down on the coyote in his arms, just now seeing how truly terrible Cameron's injuries are. I need to get you out of here. Shit, what? Ugh. In the frantic chaos of fighting off Brian and making sure his boyfriend wasn't bleeding out, Devon had forgotten someone. The butt of the shotgun, powered by the old bear's huge body, reminds him of the harsh, sickening ache that spreads in the wave through his body. Cameron hears the dull thud, followed by the vibration through Devon's thick body. He feels the bear cringe as he sinks to his knees, huddled over Cameron. A huge bear lifts up the shotgun he managed to give a hold of. He struggles holding it with only his left paw. His injured right arm dangles for he practically swings it up to prop his right elbow against the wall. A few pops coming from his shoulder as he does. He screams again when that happens. With his fully functional wrist he can now take steady aim. With how narrow the hollow is there's nowhere to go. Don't! Don't you fucking move! You got that! This is over. I'm killing that yote in front of you and then ripping your fucking arm off, boy. Brian's expression is an odd mixture of excitement and disgust. Pity ain't as half as cute as a pup. Devon can only wheeze in response, and Cameron holds on to him tightly as he's cradled in his arms. God, you fucking ruined it. It was perfectly fine till you showed up. Now he's fucking fucked up to the point he's not even fuckable. Cameron's ability to see and feel things is fading, just the effects of the shrooms are fading. Still, there's just a bit left, and Cameron tries his best to use it. Devon's body begins trembling, and Cameron holds on to him more tightly. Devon's voice, still breathless, whispers into Cameron's ear. Honey, whatever happens, just play dead, okay? No matter what. But Cameron suddenly turns. Devon watches as Cameron's face becomes a bouquet of red ribbons, and the bear stumbles as the shot hits his arm as well. Cameron's body jerks violently in his arms while going incredibly still. Devon quickly looks down to see Cameron no longer with her face. Everything that used to make up his face is splattered against the walls, and it still pours from... Cameron is gone. In shock, Devon looks at his arm and sees the whiter bone shards, first thinking it's his own. Then he sees a few of Cameron's sharp teeth also embedded into his arm. Devon leans over Cameron's body, an expression of untold anguish on his face as he starts to let a low, terrible groan that rises in pitch to a bearish howl. After looking forward, Cameron does the only thing he can think of. No! Cameron grabs the barrel and shoves up. The sound is so loud it instantly deafens Cameron, and though the ringing starts to subside, the hearing in his right ear doesn't come back. Cameron! Cameron! I'm fine, I'm fine! Cameron looks to where Brian is. The kickback from the 10 gauge had hit him hard, squarely in the chest. Cameron can almost visualise the shock sent through that old, worn-out heart, already exhausted from the stimulant and the fight. The old bear, still on steady feet, stumbles back a bit more before hitting the wall and sliding down it to sit. Ryan sits propped up against it, looking confused. He clutches his chest, rubbing it and grimacing. The shotgun is on the ground, out of Brian's reach. The old bear makes no move to get it. Fuck. He starts to try and get back up, but falls back down. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Ryan clutches his chest and stomach and groans. Oh, no. That was it. Is this it? What the fuck? What the fuck? What the... Ryan slumps back, his body convulsing. Then he thrashes about as if trying to escape something. He knocks over and smashes the electric lantern, crushing it under his weight. Several more seconds they both listen to Brian's groaning, rasping and snorting before it's silent. It's quiet for a little while longer. 
Cameron and Devon not daring to move. Ryan had seemed invincible for so long, Cameron can't get himself to believe that it might be over. Devon whispers into Cameron's ear. Cameron, how do you feel? Cameron gives Devon a look that's a mix of love and exasperation, even if Devon can't see it right now. They both know he's badly fucked up. I think something ruptured. Feels all wrong. Cameron places his right paw on his own torso, wincing. Don't move, okay? I'll get us out. I'll get us out in no time. Devon starts to tentatively make his way forward. Just as Cameron's realising how long this might actually take, possibly too long as any internal bleeding, his vision flickers. Cameron stares at it, then looks at Devon, wincing at the bear's bloodied and bruised face. But Devon doesn't react to the light, like Cameron is the only one seeing it. The shroom trip can't emit light, no matter how hard you're tripping. I think I can see where to go. I just walk straight. Well... Cameron starts to shake his head, then stops as his neck sends a pang of fiery pain down his back. I don't know, but I can see. Let's just get out of here. Please. Cameron tries hard not to look at Brian's crumpled form against the side wall of the hollow, his wide open eyes glinting from the gentle glow. Okay, just tell me where, okay? And sure enough, as they leave, arch after arch appears, and Cameron's confident they'll lead to the exit. These arches have tortured his mother. This feels like his mother somehow. As they move, they both hear rustling sounds far behind them in their minds. But Brian is definitely dead, or at least had been when they left. So they keep moving, trying to keep quiet. Then, within an hour, real light. Daylight. Devon looks down at Cameron and winces just like Cameron did when he saw Devon's face. God, honey. We're going to get you help, and you're going to get better, okay? What about you? Do you feel okay? Cameron's voice is weaker than it was earlier, and Cameron feels Devon quicken his pace. Oh, I'm fine. Devon says it sternly, setting his jaw, and Cameron stays quiet. Cameron, I'm sorry. And that's the, the last time you're saying that to me, okay? I don't blame you for anything. I'm just so glad I met you. He listens to the bear's heartbeat, steady for most of the journey, but getting faster as they get closer to the exit. I think I hear a helicopter, or maybe a megaphone. Shit, did people come for us? The shot can blew up my hearing, so I'm not, I'm not really sure. This trip is mostly over, yet these visions are so vivid. Cameron stares at this new arch, and something about it feels different. Oh. Mom. I found it. Huh? An arch. You've seen arches. You know, if something can happen that's so impactful, it splits your life in two. Like, you see life as before and after that moment. It could be good or bad. Devon hesitates, like he wants an answer to the question he just asked. He lets it go for now. Well, of course. I think meeting you is a good divide in my life. I think what happened to you, what's going to happen after. I think it's the bad divide. It's always been his mother's death, and it still is. A divide. But this time, Cameron realizes he's been deeply affected mentally. It's not something he can just recover from. Something truly wrong with him. It's been the case for a long time. But now, after this, something's been pushed over the edge. So, another divide. I think we're going to be okay, Cameron. Evan, whatever happens after this, I love you. I'm so happy I met you. Come on, you didn't have to say that first part. We made it. Okay? It was just it was just a fork in the road. Cameron gasps. 
Oh, heaven. Hearty's alive. He went to get his help, I think. I hope. What? How? I don't know. He got shot, but he got away. Oh, Ryan was pissed. He's hurt, but I think he made it. Oh. Oh, that's... Devon's lips tremble. His face twists up slightly as he tries not to cry. It was out of incredible relief and happiness. Cameron doesn't tell him how bits of Artie are missing, or that he can't sense him anymore. Both because of his waning powers and because Artie is too far away. At least that's what he hopes. Cameron stares up at the arch, looking both beautiful and terrible at the same time. Raincoat monster stands to the side as they pass. And this time Cameron does think it is all hallucination. Cardboard and then moving. Just like he's always been. But something about all of this, the way he's seen things, something has changed. It's only psychic abilities, because now it's subtle and hardly noticeable again. No, something else happened, and his mind feels wrong. Looking forward is no longer clear, but as Cameron uses the last of the psilocybin and insistent to appear into their future, he becomes afraid by what he sees. So he just turns his muzzle slightly to Devon. Cameron, we are going to make it. Based on what he saw, Cameron isn't sure. Devon will stay, he's able to see that much. But should he? More than anything, they both want to stay together. If Cameron becomes a burden to Devon, he doesn't know how he can stay. He just hopes that Devon can still love him after this terrible change, and he hopes he can fight it, whatever it is. So Cameron leans his head against Devon's shoulder, smiling in a mostly happy, but slightly sad way. All right. All right, let's get the hell out of here.